Reinforcing loops are where you have a situation that <coughs> one thing promotes another, which promotes the first, the first item that you thought of. An example often quoted is, is population and birth rate. So, given you've got external factors in here, which we need to talk about in detail, one of which the population is affected by the, by the death rate, and the birth rate is affected by the fertility of the population. Okay, and I believe it's, it's happening now that in advanced nations, the apparent fertility of, of, of people, maybe it's by choice, uh, is apparently diminishing. But that system within itself does not balance. Okay, if, um, if that is left to its own devices, so long as you have a population, a breeding population, that will just continue indefinitely. So a loop such as that, which is a reinforcing loop, would need to be moderated by some <coughs> external effect. And the external effect would be, for example, habitat, um, that certain animals can only produce, you know, or can only breed to a certain level because they then start suffering from loss of habitat, or they become more attracted to predators, and the predators then have a balancing loop which intersects with this, and so forth. But in principle, that will always go upwards until it reaches some limit which is determined by the environment and not actually shown on the loop itself. If now we have another look at a slightly different one, incidentally, notes on here, terminology should always be consistent with that in common use. You must use, if you're obviously doing this as a team effort, to communicate with other people, which is really what CLDs are for, you need to be clear about using whatever terminology those people are used to, otherwise they're just going to get confused and think, oh, that should be increasing when you, you're intended to express the fact that it ought to be reducing. Okay, and obviously the links polarity have to be consistent. <coughs> so, in this particular case, we have a reinforcing loop, which so long as you have a non-zero population to begin with, can only ever go upwards. But not all reinforcing loops are like that. Um, here's another one. We have um, production problems and staff morale. Okay, there are many other factors in real life, but if staff morale is low, then the production problems uh, will be high. You know, people will tend to be careless and so forth. Right? And if you have a lot of production problems, then that uh, will also act to reduce staff morale. They won't feel that they're part of anything that anybody really cares about. And you tend to get this loop. So if you have low staff morale, then that can lead to a spiral, what they call a vicious circle, where the, the, the thing spirals and some serious dramatic intervention is usually necessary, like a change of management or a change of processes or <coughs> something like that. Um, on the other hand, if by some means, maybe by using Lean or, or, or Six Sigma, you introduce a, a system which improves your production and reduces your production problem, your production <coughs> problems, then all those who are involved will feel encouraged. Even though they might not actually be involved in the initiative you've taken, they're part of the process, will feel encouraged, they feel part of an organization that cares about what they do, morale will improve, and production problems will um, uh, continue going down even though your intervention stops. We look at the third example, we now have four uh, elements. Um, so here we have productivity. If productivity is good, unit costs go down. If unit costs go down, financial restraints go down, right, because you're in a more profitable situation. If financial res restraints go down, your, your resource investment can go back up, can go up. You've got more money to um, more cash flow, if you like, to invest. And if your resource investment goes up, your productivity will go up. So here you have a reinforcing loop. And so long as you keep reinvesting your profits, as you will see with an illustration I'm going to give you a little bit later, you'll see that if your re resource investment keeps going up, then you're in a spiral of benefits until in the end you <coughs> come to some limit on the other hand, if for any reason productivity goes down or um, the 
price of materials might go up, so that will up the cost of your unit costs. Then your financial restraints uh, will become more severe, your resource <coughs> investment will have to be cut back, and your productivity will suffer accordingly. And the thing can then end up in a spiral of decline. <coughs> Um, and you will become uh, less and less com uh, competitive in relation to those in your industry, your competitors. So, in either case, um, you, in both of these cases, and in the general case where you have a, re a reinforcing loop, it will tend to um, accelerate to one limit or another, the limit being determined usually by other factors. Um, You'll notice in the in the reinforcing loop, we we have an even number of reversals or antiphase elements. All right, um, and it doesn't matter how many elements there are in that uh, loop. If there are an even number of antiphases, then effectively you've gone plus minus plus minus plus and ended up with a plus again, uh, which is what in people like me in electronics call positive feedback. Um, but positive feedback doesn't necessarily mean it goes up, it, can be, it gets driven down as well. Okay, so um, incidentally, if I very quickly go back to the previous one, you'll see that I've highlighted in red production problems. It is commonly said by experts on this subject that loops have no beginning and no end. Well, that is most emphatically wrong loops do have a beginning and an end. They just happen to be in the same place. Um, sounds a bit like double speak, doesn't it? But why, why bother producing a loop, particularly if it's realistic and complicated? Why bother to produce the loop if you are not trying to solve a problem or deal with some sort of initiative like growing the company or whatever it might be? So people need to know why. Why are we doing this? What is the focus? What are we trying to achieve? Then it helps them get in gear. And that's why my own convention, you know, you don't have to do the same, but my own convention is to say, well, whatever it is that we're aiming to do something about, which is maybe the symptom of the problem, um, I'll put it in red. Um, and that makes it stand out. That immediately draws your eye. Why is that in red? And, and what I could do as well, I could do that. Um, and make sure it does get, and make sure it can't get possibly get ignored. <coughs> All right. So, uh, as I say, contrary to popular belief, um, these loops, to be of any value as a communication tool, have to have beginnings and ends. It just happens that beginning and end is in the same place. Example four. This, again, as with the. Um, uh, balancing loops shows um, an ex what I call an external, what some people call dangles, where we have productivity leading to profits, leading to resource investment, uh, leading to reduce resource problems. And here I propose that the problem we're trying to deal with is the problems we're having uh, with our resources. Can we make better use of them? Can we maintain them better so they fail less often? Whatever it is. Uh, which is affecting our productivity. Um, now that might be going along and then for some reason uh, the market changes and the sales department say we've got to discount our output, <coughs> we've got to cut our prices. If that happens you think well that's no business of the production department but of course it is because if you discount the price it, that cuts profits which cuts the availability of investment for resources and then that gets reflected back into the resources available to production and production suffer. And this happens all over the place. So here we have the situation that sales discounting can flip something which is working out nicely, profits leading to more investment in resources, leading to better productivity, leading to more profits, and the company is building up and building up nicely. And then something happens in the marketplace possibly and you have a glitch, and the whole loop suddenly flips and starts spiraling downwards, even when the initial cause has gone away. So the one thing that um, uh, reinforcing loops have <coughs> is if they, if they go wrong, they can often be a lot easier to put right, and I'll show you how this works with some more realistic examples. 
So, so there we go. Uh, again, you will see that I'm using color, um, and we can use emphasis, um, where you've got several loops. You can say, well, this is the main loop. This is the one that's really the, the crux of the problem. These other things are, if you like, side effects that we have to take into account. You can use different techniques. So there we go. Um, that's example four. There's one more example of reinforcing loops. And this is where you have a, a reinforcing loop which is <coughs> modulated by a balancing loop. So here we have the same situation. Uh, we have, um, I've highlighted borrowings here because maybe that is the problem. That our bank has said, boy, you know, you're on the limit of your, your borrowing limit. Um, and we're going to start kicking you for, um, you know, interest payments and service charges and all the rest of it. But the borrowings lead to profit. The more you're, you're servicing borrowings, the more it cuts into your profits. You're paying interest on things. Um, profits, of course, help um, to fund production. Production provides net income, and net income pays off your borrowings. Hence the negative or anti-phase here. All right? But that, if your net income doesn't exceed the cost of servicing your borrowings, then you have a spiral of decline because you would just get deeper and deeper into debt until the time comes when the, the boom gets dropped on you. So, but, so what can happen here also is your profits lead to funding greater production, but of course production incurs materials and production costs. You've got to buy the materials, you've got to pay the people who run it, and you've got all your you know, um, energy bills and all the rest of it which are um, output related. So they come back and then cut into your profits. So your profits are hit um, partly by the cost of, of funding your, your borrowings and partly, of course, by the cost of materials and labor in your production. And this loop, you will see here, has one negative. It is a balancing loop. The, if your production goes down, then your costs of production also <coughs> go down. And that does tend to help stabilize things a little bit. Um, it isn't the answer. The answer is to make quite sure that you have made enough profit to service your your overdraft. So that's um, the end of that section. So we've looked at balancing loops, we've looked <coughs> at reinforcing loops, and we've very briefly looked at how the loops can interact. The next section will show you some more detailed examples of what happens in real practice.